Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Ladi Akiri Dunduale. The headlines. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says his army has liberated new areas and is advancing. Director of Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, Ihor Muroshov, is now released, according to the IAEA. And the Swedish Coast Guard says the leak from Nord Stream 2 pipeline has increased in size. Ukrainian troops have retaken more territory in regions annexed by Russia with Kiev's forces advancing near the southern city of Kherson and consolidating gains in the east. Russian installed officials in Kherson confirmed the advance but said Moscow's forces were digging in. In the east, Ukrainian forces pushed into the Russian-held Luhansk region. President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine says there are new liberated settlements in several areas. Speaking during his nightly address, President Zelensky said fierce fighting continues in many areas, but he did not give details. Today, the offensive movement of our army and all our defenders continued. There are new liberated settlements in several regions. Fierce fighting continues in many areas of the front. But the prospect of these hostilities is obvious. More and more occupiers are trying to escape. The enemy army is suffering more and more losses. And there is a growing understanding that Russia made a mistake by starting the war against Ukraine. At the same time, everything is being done quite intensively at various government levels to restore normal life in the areas liberated from the occupiers. In total, there are more than 450 settlements, settlements in the Kharkiv region alone, which were liberated thanks to the defense operation, which was launched in September and is still ongoing. Meanwhile, if Russian President Vladimir Putin uses nuclear weapons, the United States and its allies would destroy Russia's troops and equipment in Ukraine. And that's coming from a retired four-star army general, uh, David Petraeus. He says, hypothetically, the U.S. would respond to Russia by leading a NATO collective effort that would take out every Russian conventional force. Ukraine had claimed full control of the eastern logistics hub of Aliman, its most significant battlefield gain from Russia in weeks, providing a potential staging post for further attacks to the east while heaping further pressure on the Kremlin. The setback for Russian President Vladimir Putin was delivered just a couple of hours after he proclaimed the annexation of four regions covering nearly a fifth of Ukraine on Friday. Um, we would respond by leading a NATO, a collective effort, that would take out every Russian conventional force that we can see and identify on the battlefield in Ukraine and also in Crimea and every ship on the, in the Black Sea. Uh, but it's also desperate. Uh, he is losing. And the battlefield reality he faces is, I think, irreversible. In other words, over the last seven months, President Zelensky and Ukraine have mobilized vastly better than has Russia. In other words, Ukraine has recruited, trained, equipped, organized, and employed forces incomparably better than Russia has. And the reality facing Russia now is that Ukraine, a country a third the size of Russia, has a bigger, much more effective army on the ground and other assets as well. All of this, of course, supported by the arsenal of democracy. The United States now up to $17 billion, over another billion announced this week, in military arms, ammunition, and materiel, and also supported by the other NATO countries and other Western countries around the world. So he faces a situation that I think, again, is irreversible. There is no amount of shambolic mobilization, which is the only way to describe it, no amount of annexation, no amount of even veiled nuclear threats uh, can actually get him out of this particular situation. He announced the annexation, and he's already lost a really critical uh, element in that, a critical city that would have been a very key supply hub had they been able to go farther. And that's just going to continue. He's going to continue to lose on the battlefield. Uh, and at some point, there's going to have to be recognition of that. At some point, there's going to have to be some kind of beginning of negotiations, as President Zelensky has said, will be the ultimate end. And at some point, by the way, as well, I strongly agree 
uh, with the idea of Ukraine becoming part of NATO, although, as Senator Rubio noted, let's mm -hmm. make sure that the battlefield goes well. And as Ukrainian forces achieve their breakthrough in the country's south, busting across Russian uh, uh, lines, Ukrainian human rights lawyer Alexander Matvichuk says this military defeat in Ukraine provides the first signs of bankruptcy of Putin's ratings in Russia. Uh, Matvichuk heads the Center for Civil Liberties in Ukraine and was in New York to speak at the 2022 Oslo Freedom Forum. She won the 2022 Right Livelihood Award, known as Sweden's Alternative Nobel Prize. If we do not stop Putin in Ukraine, he will go further. That's why we need to stop him. And Putin will stop only when he will be stopped. In order to achieve it as quickly as possible, Ukraine needs weapons, an efficient amount. Because Russian people will tolerate war criminals, but they will not tolerate looting war criminals. And this military defeat in, um, in Ukraine uh, provides the first sign of bankruptcy of Putin ratings in Russia. Uh, second, we need sanctions. Uh, now we have a plenty of sanctions, and people asked, why do you need more? But the truth is that we need sanctions at the level which can prove that the ability of Russian economy to feed this war. And this has not happened already, unfortunately. And third, we need justice. I spoke with different politicians from different countries, and they told about peace. I want peace. But there will be no sustainable peace in our region without justice. Because Russia, for decades, used this war as the methods how to achieve their geopolitical goals, and uses war crimes as a methods how to win these wars. So they enjoyed impunity for decades, and this led to the situation when Russians start to think that they can do whatever they wanted. So if we need sustainable peace, we have to break the circle from unity. We must hold Putin and other war criminals accountable. This uh, fake referendums has nothing similar with legal procedure. It's informational space operation. And Putin tried to repeat his success when he organized the same fake referendum under guns in 2014 in Crimea. And for that time, uh, my mobiles groups of our organization worked here. And we reported about hundreds and hundreds of violations, intimidations, abductions of people, beating in of a peaceful demonstration for unity of Ukraine, etc. But several hours, several years um, began, and then people in Europe and in other countries start to think, but maybe Crimeans want to join to Russia voluntarily. Let's talk now to former uh, Commander Operation Safe Haven Military Operations Strategist, uh, Major General Augustin Agundu, joins us from our Abuja studio. Good morning to you, General. Thank you for your time. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Ladi. Let me begin with uh, the, 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 what we've been hearing. Uh, it does appear as if uh, people are rapidly coming to the conclusion that Russia has lost this war. Is, will that be a fair point to make at this stage? Um, it's unfortunate if we make such a, if, if we take such position, uh, because we shouldn't be talking in uh, what uh, the UK Chief of Defense Intelligence said is binary terms of who is losing and who is uh, winning, or whether it's going to be a stalemate. But it's taking a very, very dangerous dimension the entirety of what is happening. That's why special military operation is no longer special military operation. So we have to be extremely careful. The world has to be extremely careful the dimension that we are going so that we do not um, uh, uh, take ourselves back to 1945. So many people, yesterday I was, I was raising this point and I, I will ask you as well, which is that um, it does appear, as you've just pointed out, the way things are going, um, 
there's a sense of deja vu about all of this, uh, and that is, it looks like it's possible that a number of other people uh, will be drawn into this conflict nearly willy. Already you had uh, General Petros there saying that uh, if Russia uses nuclear weapons, uh, the United States and its allies under the NATO collective will destroy all of Russia's troops and equipment in uh, Ukraine. And then you have things like the leak in, uh, um, in the Nord Stream pipeline of uh, Sweden and Denmark, and then, of course, mobilization to protect gas infrastructure. So, and you have a number of other countries which are also on the ground feeling out what is their own interest. So I ask you, do you see a situation where it is possible that other parties that are not currently part of this conflict directly may be drawn into it by an act of omission or commission? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of uh, countries that are getting interested in the situation that is going there. So we can easily say now that um, uh, the uh, Ukraine has apparently appeared to be the proxy country from perhaps an uh, erstwhile uh, uh, war game that has been on. Uh, over decades across uh, uh, the the eastern side of of, uh, of Europe, so it's a, a like I said, it's a very dangerous dimension. Um, we have to be extremely, extremely so careful in order not to drag the whole world into it's yet to be pronounced World War Three, but all the indications are there, and it's a very dangerous uh, um, um, dimension. Equally, um, it's, a, it's a moment for us uh, in Africa to start taking stock of what happens in case we go into there. These countries, they have tactical nuclear units, and uh, these tactical nuclear units might be under the control or command and control of the of the president and uh, the heads of government of these nations or whatnot. So um, a rogue person could easily trigger what is not anticipated. And then the rest could be as a, we are going gradually towards annihilation of the human race. It's a very dangerous dimension that we are taking up. So what do we do going forward? We're back here in, uh, in Nigeria, and I, I must appreciate Channel TV for the elaborate way you cover this, uh, this uh, Russian-Ukraine uh, crisis. But we should be thinking of what, uh, how we're going to take the opportunities that uh, this, unfortunately, opportunity that this uh, conflict has uh, presented, how do we take it to our own advantage? Because there are a lot of things that we need to do to bridge the, uh, 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 the gap, right from the military to economic to agriculture and all whatnot. So a lot of countries are going now. The whole world is facing Ukraine. The whole world is facing the crisis in Ukraine. The whole world is facing Russia, is the aggressor and all whatnot. But we know from military history that no conflict has ended on the battlefield. Now Ukraine is asking for more advanced weapons. The level of weaponry in, uh, is already in Ukraine. And do not forget, these weapons are NATO weapons. They are not the Warsaw weapon that they, they are used to in the past. So what it means is that there are some other NATO uh, uh, trainees, trainers and uh, training going on to make them perfect the use of uh, these uh, uh, NATO weapons. Now we see the devastating effect this has given them. They've gotten some edge, but this edge that they have gotten um, we do not know from the Russian side what they are planning. And uh, the, the areas that Russia has pulled out from, it, is, it said it's the pulled out. Whether they are totally defeated, what the, what the reason is for those pull out is also a dangerous question. So what is going on within Russia? Are they actually down and out, or are they strategizing for a more lethal effect? Time will tell. The, the point you made about the amount of weaponry that is in uh, Ukraine cannot be overemphasized, and the control of that weaponry, if you recollect, earlier in this conflict, uh, the Western uh, 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 nations were reluctant uh, to send m uh, most of these uh, more sophisticated weapons to Ukraine, because the truth is that before the conflict started, Ukraine was not exactly uh, uh, um, a poster child for effective government and all of that, it was being uh, uh, looked at, but it wasn't. Now, all these weapons are there. You have the Russians' weapons that uh, 
have, uh, have been seized, as we are told. Uh, you have uh, the weapons that Ukraine itself had, what you referred to as Warsaw Pact weapons. And then you had the weapons now being sent by America, Britain, and all the others, and the training that is accompanying it. Now, even if problems don't come from the battlefront at that level, what happens to these weapons after the, the conflict has been concluded one way or the other, either by victory on the battlefield or by peace negotiations at the table? Those weapons, as we have seen from history, are not going to all be accounted for uh, in the major part, and the more lethal ones uh, may end up in the wrong hands. You are absolutely correct. You are, you are absolutely correct. Let us go back to what, what, how the United States pulled out of Afghanistan. The weaponry they left there, they are still there. Let us go back to what's happened in Libya. And that is why we're also having these troubles with, in, within the country. Because a lot of weapons are, from Libya is being trickled southwards into Nigeria. Let us see, let's go also to what happened all over the world regarding uh, this. It's a dangerous dimension. And there is no accountability for this uh, weaponry. There is no accountability for the ammunition and all whatnot. And uh, the worst of it all is that some areas might be mined. We are not yet, uh, we've not gotten to that, uh, to that extent. The uh, places that Russians must have pulled out from, they must have mined those areas. And recall that we still have the effect of uh, the Second World War mining of, uh, during the North African campaign in uh, Egypt. While some part of Egypt up to this day, they are just cut on off because of landmines and, and, and the like. So um, uh, we are in a very precarious situation in the, in this, uh, uh, in the world. And unless uh, a concerted effort, unless the rational reasoning is put into cognizance, I mean, uh, we might be losing humanity to, at a scale never been seen before. Um, if, if you recall um, also in the build up to, this, uh, to America getting involved in the Second World War, it's also the same because somebody, uh, uh, private individuals were the ones that tested uh, 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 the atomic bomb that was, it was all by a private company. And at the end of it, uh, of it all, uh, th those, uh, uh, they saw the effects when they tested it and they used it on humans and the diversity effect of those is still there today. So weapons are littered all over Ukraine. And of course, um, following the pullout of uh, Russian troops from uh, uh, Lebanon, it is uh, estimated that they left in a hurry, or either it was a gun or an organized one or not. So apparently, they must also left behind some weapons. So Eastern Europe is saturated with a lot of weapons at a magnitude that had never been seen before, and the effect could be more devastating than we think. At our own level back here, and you alluded to it in the answer to uh, uh, my uh, second question, uh, on the African continent, uh, our own um, effect, if you like, of uh, this has been mainly uh, economic, um, food supply, rising inflation, and all of that. We haven't yet felt uh, uh, the, uh, the, the military, shall we say, consequences of this. And uh, there will be those who will be saying that, well, um, we are not really in the middle of it yet, and uh, we are likely to be. But as you said, what lessons are there in this uh, for those who may be thinking strategically? What, what are some of the lessons that one can take away from the last seven and a half months or so of this conflict? Yeah, a very good uh, uh, question. Um, what, we, what Nigeria should be doing now is looking at the agricultural outputs that we have in this country. We have the abundance. We should, like I said, it's, there are opportunities that are bound. Now, we, are exp uh, we should be, um, I believe that the policy planners and all those who are at the helm of affairs are working assiduously to increase our agricultural yield. This is an opportunity for us to feed the world. The whole of the Middle Belt is, uh, is uh, from uh, um, Niger State up to Taraba State. They are all fertile ground that we should be able to be producing wheat. And do not, uh, we do know, of course, that uh, Egypt consumes almost 50% of the wheat production from Ukraine, same as other countries like Sudan and um, Tunisia and all whatnot. At this moment, since they are not having any agricultural produce, we should be, if we have been, uh, 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 if we have upped up our game in, in our agricultural uh, revolution, we should be feeding all these countries by now. 
And look at, uh, of course, we saw how um, uh, the organized way of uh, shipment from uh, Ukraine, uh, which is under the auspices of, uh, of Turkey, moving uh, grains from Ukraine and it being monitored until it's being delivered even up to Djibouti. So, and here we are, look at the, the proximity of these countries to us. If, our, uh, if we had been serious with our yields in, in, uh, in uh, wheat, in, in corn, in maize, and everything that we get, millet and all whatnot, even alternatives, all whatnot, we should increase our output and export to this country. Perhaps the continental African uh, free trade is an op it's an opportunity for us to open up that window also and see how far we can support other African nations. In, uh, in this. So it's a great lesson for us in Nigeria. And uh, it brings me to mind also regarding the, the Ajokuta Kaduna Kanu pipeline, gas pipeline, which of course ends in, if it is possible, those, uh, I believe too, that uh, the, our policy makers and our policy planners are also looking into the, the uh, probability of extending uh, this pipeline even up to Algeria and eventually to get into Europe. Because sooner than later, the winter is here and um, it's going to be quite devastating for these uh, European countries to survive the winter. So we have a lot of opportunities that we can, we can gather from this uh, opportunity and we have to seize it very effectively. If not for now, our plan, we should go back to the drawing board and see how much we can support our, how much our country can support the rest of Africa. And we have the capacity and the capability to do that. Indeed, we do. Former Commander Operation Safe Haven, Military Operation Strategist, Major General Augustine Agundu, thank you for your time uh, this morning and thank you for your perspective. It's a pleasure, always. Still to come on the program, Ukraine's President Zelensky scoffs at billionaire Elon Musk's peace plan, while Russia jokes that he is a secret agent. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back to the program. The Kremlin says it favors a, quote, balanced approach to the issue of nuclear weapons, not uh, emotion, after a key ally of President Vladimir Putin called over the weekend for Russia to use a low-yield nuclear weapon in Ukraine. Asked about the comments by Ramzan Kadyrov, leader of the Chechnya region, who also criticized Russia's military leadership over battlefield setbacks, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said he had the right to voice his opinion, but that Russia's military approach should not be driven by emotions. Mr. Peskov adds that the basis for any use of nuclear weapons was set down in Russia's nuclear doctrine. Those guidelines allow for the use of nuclear weapons if they or another weapon of mass destruction are used against Russia or if the Russian state faces an existential threat from conventional weapons. The Kremlin has made clear that those nuclear protections extend to the four regions of Ukraine that Moscow is in the process of formally annexing. Last month, Mr. Putin had warned the West he was not bluffing when he said Russia was prepared to use nuclear weapons to protect its territory. On Friday, he had said the United States had created a, quote, precedent by dropping nuclear bombs on Japan at the end of World War II. The International Atomic Energy Agency says it's uh, the director general of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has now been released. Ihor Murashov, who is responsible for nuclear and radiation safety at the facility, was taken from his car at around 4 p.m. on Friday on the road leading to it, according to Enagatom, the Ukrainian national energy company. The company said he had been blindfolded and taken to an unknown de uh, destination. Enagatom appealed to the IAEA, the UN's nuclear agency, to help secure Mr. Murashov's release. His detention by Russia stoked concerns about the security of Europe's largest nuclear plant. Rafael Mariano Grossi, the director general of the IAEA, says that he had received confirmation that Mr. Murashov had returned to his family safely. The Swedish Coast Guard says there was, no, uh, there was no visible leak from Nord Stream 1 pipeline, but a smaller leak from Nord Stream 2 was still visible. In a statement it released, the larger leak is now no longer visible on the surface, while the smaller one instead has increased slightly. The observations were made during an overflight at around 8 a.m. of the two pipelines suspected to have been damaged. 
All of the leaks in the Nord Stream pipelines were discovered on Monday last week. These leaks were in the Baltic Sea off the Danish island of Bornholm. Danish authorities have estimated that all the gas trapped in the pipelines would have escaped by Sunday. Two of the leaks are located in the Swedish exclusive economic zone and the two others in the Danish one. Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines, which connect Russia to Germany, have been at the center of geopolitical tensions as Russia cut gas supplies to Europe in a retaliation of Western sanctions following Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. In the meantime, economist Jeffrey Sachs has speculated that the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines was the work of the U.S. and maybe Poland. To the chagrin of his Bloomberg TV host who quickly tried to change the subject. Now a professor at Columbia University, Mr. Sachs became notorious in Russia for masterminding the shock therapy reforms in the 1990s, but has been sharply critical of the West's approach to the conflict in Ukraine in recent months. Invited uh, to the surveillance show, Mr. Sachs was asked to comment on Russia he knew so well under President Boris Yeltsin. Instead, the host scrambled to cut him off after he said the conflict is on the path of escalation to nuclear war and did not start in February of 2022. Mr. Sachs told uh, Tom Kane that most of the world doesn't see it the way we describe it. And at that point, the co-host tried to change the subject to inflation in Europe. Billionaire Elon Musk is asking Twitter users to weigh in on a plan to end Russia's war in Ukraine, and that has drawn immediate condemnation from the Ukrainians, including President Vladimir Zelensky, who responded with his own poll. Mr. Musk, the world's richest person, proposed UN-supervised elections in four occupied regions that Moscow last week moved to annex after what it called referenda. The votes were denounced by Kiev and Western governments as illegal and coercive. Mr. Mosk had written, Russia leaves if that is the will of the people. The Tesla Inc. chief executive also suggested that Crimea, which Moscow seized in 2014, be formally recognized as part of Russia and that water supply to Crimea be assured and that Ukraine remain neutral. He asked Twitter users to vote yes or no on the plan, adding that he didn't care if his proposal was unpopular, arguing that he did care that millions of people may die needlessly for an essentially identical outcome. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky responded. With his own poll on Twitter, Mr. Zelensky asked his followers which Elon Musk they like more, the one who supports Ukraine or the one who supports uh, Russia. And at the time of uh, this report, just under 85% had chosen the former. While reactions continue to spring up to the Musk plan, former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev has called the Tesla founder a shadowy agent of the Kremlin. That's after the Ukrainian leader and Kiev's online troll army savaged Mr. Musk's proposal for ending the conflict with Russia. Mr. Medvedev went on to compare him to Sterlitz, a legendary fictional Soviet spy. In his Telegram uh, message in Russian, instead of shadowy agent, the former president called Mr. Musk Eustace, a uh, reference to the code name of the main character in the Soviet era series uh, Moments of Spring, better known under his ge uh, German alias Otto von Sterlitz. Both references were clearly tongue in cheek and poked fun not at Mr. Musk, but at the utter hysterics of the Ukrainian government and its online influences over the American billionaire's peace proposal. Russia has placed Marina Ostyanivo on uh, the Ministry of Internal Affairs wanted list after her ex-husband reported that she had escaped from pre-trial house arrest. Marina is the former journalist at State Control Channel 1 who went on air with an anti-war poster. According to her entry on the fugitives list, as quoted Russian state media TASS, Osvayinova Marina Vladimirovna, uh, born June 19, 1978, place of birth a uh, uh, Ukrainian SSR city of Odessa, is wanted under the article of the Criminal Code of the Russian Federation. She was placed under house arrest until October 9 by a court in Moscow uh, after like being charged with disseminating uh, false information about the Russian armed forces. Dmitry Zavatov, Osaniova's lawyer, said the reason for the accusation was a protest with Marina's participation on the embankment in Moscow on July the 15th. Her ex-husband, Igor Oskaniov, said on Saturday she had escaped from house arrest 
taking uh, their daughter with her. It was my own anti-war decision. Yeah, if I made this decision by myself because I uh, uh, don't like um, uh, Russia, Russia start this uh, invasion and um, it's, uh, it was really terrible. Ukraine's energy company Naftogaz CEO Yuri Vitrenko says that Ukraine increased its gas production by 4% for it to be able to fulfill Ukrainian customers' need for gas and heat. He also called recent ruptures on the Nord Stream gas pipeline a sabotage. Russia's Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines burst this week, uh, draining gas into the Baltic Sea off the coast of Denmark and uh, Sweden. Seismologists also registered explosions in the area. The European Union said its suspected sabotage had caused the damage, while Russian President Putin accused the United States and its allies of blowing up the pipelines. Washington had said then it was too early to confirm it was sabotage and dismissed talks it was responsible. Uh, when Gazprom uh, started to threaten uh, Naftagas, uh, that uh, Russia would impose some sanctions on Naftagas and it would lead uh, to uh, interruption of transit through Ukraine uh, to Europe. We also see a uh, decrease in flows. Uh, we see some very um, hostile and not uh, business-like uh, behavior of Gazprom. And that's why the, uh, we perceive um, the situation, what happened uh, to Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, as a part of this uh, uh, bigger picture of sabotage. Global recession can be avoided if government's fiscal policies were consistent with monetary policy tightening, but likely there will be countries falling into recession next year. This is coming from the International Monetary Fund's Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva. She says in the context of monetary policy tightening, fiscal policy cannot stay idle because the cost of living crisis is hitting parts of society dramatically. She adds that fiscal policies that indiscriminately support everybody by suppressing energy prices and providing subsidies are working against monetary uh, policy purposes. We do need central banks to act decisively. Why? Because inflation is very stubborn. We see now secondary impact of energy and food prices into core inflation in many countries. And if it is not stopped in its steps, it is bad for growth and it is very bad for poor people. Inflation is a tax on the poor. So you have monetary policy putting a foot on the brakes and fiscal policy putting a foot on the accelerator. We are likely to see an impact on unemployment, unemployment going up, and that will be the time for the Fed to say, we have done our job, uh, we can ease uh, uh, in the future. We are not there yet. I can only give you one name of a country because uh, a mission is now uh, authorized to go. This is Malawi. There, the question would be a program, full-fledged program, or emergency financing followed by a program. Okay. I can confirm that with both countries, we are in a very advanced stage of discussing uh, a staff level agreement. Uh, whether it would be within days or weeks, hard to predict, but it would be very soon. I'm a uh, managing director, Kristalina Georgieva. Ini John McQua is here. Morning, Ini. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, uh, it's winter is here. My, my guest on the program today uh, alluded to that. Uh, so it wouldn't be a complete surprise that we're seeing a rise uh, in the uh, sales of electric heaters. Uh, but there are those who are, as you're buying the heater, there's a fear that there won't be enough gas. Yes. So why it's actually making the news is because when you compare the sales of electric heater uh, between, uh, it's, it's not the normal ones that they have in their home. It's like, you know, when you have those little hand fans, you That's know, right. those heaters, it's 76% higher than what was purchased this time last year. That's so, a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. I mean, getting close to 100% and we haven't even gotten to the peak of winter, winter yet. So yeah. we don't know yeah. what it's going to look like, you know, so that's why it's catching attention. So obviously people are looking for alternative, not to depend on the national 
heat, you know, that will be coming for electricity and all of that. They're trying to conserve Make their own, their exactly, own uh, arrangements, Exactly, so to speak. you know, but uh, at the end of the day, it's pulling on still the power grid because you still need that electricity to charge or recharge those, those heaters, heaters right. before you can use it. So that's the fear that is going to put a lot of load on plan load because, I mean, I think the government didn't really see that coming. So even though they had all those plans, uh, reduction of uh, consumption in peak hours and everything, they didn't see this This coming. one was not part of the exactly. arrangement. Exactly. And, you know, you can hardly stop people in their homes from recharging it's, it's their private, heaters. It's private, it's their business exactly. and it's their money. Exactly, you know. So they're afraid that this might actually pull on that power that they're trying to conserve at the end of the day uh, because people, of course, want to be the one to manage when they can use the heater and not when governments would decide that they will give it to them. Then the other thing is that when you look at uh, uh, other major countries in Europe, in that area, including the UK this time, there's been a drop, a drop in the sales of heaters. So it's only in Germany that, that people this are having rise. this idea, yes. So we don't know if tomorrow people will or see other this Other people and say, why don't we try this? <laughs> exactly. This looks like a working plan. Can I just adopt this? But at this moment, it's in Germany that we're seeing this huge jump of about 76%. Uh, almost of 1 million, uh, from, from the records here, almost 1 million yes. electric heaters have been sold yes. uh, since the start of this year. Since the beginning of the year. It's, it's a huge jump. And that's why people are talking about it and looking at the consequences, of which... That. Uh, may not be so good uh, in, the, in the short and even medium term. Exactly. Now, yes. uh, in Britain itself, I'm happy you mentioned the UK, there's a significant risk of gas shortage there mm. as well. And that's not speculation, that's coming from its regulation. Of gem, yes. Right. You, you know, uh, when we say the world is global, it's one, we know that UK doesn't depend on Russia for gas. But when it's something affects one, uh, I mean, the other time we talked about how tourists we're moving to other countries. Absolutely. Of course, that means that that's more consumption of electricity in those countries. countries. You understand? Even though they're not depending on Russia, but the consequences of it is now felt. Because the supply market is tighter, yes. and therefore... Uh, the price will go up. Obviously, and... obviously. And you know, that's uh, one of the catches that uh, Liz Truss used, you know, when she was coming in. Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the promise to keep uh, um, uh, energy prices at a cap. Right. Both for, I think for six months for businesses and longer, I think two years for, for, house, for households. households, you know. So, but now Ofgem is warning that it looks like it's really close um, and they may not be able to escape it this winter. There's going to be shortage of gas, gas. in the United Kingdom. And, uh, well, one of the reasons why they're talking about it, you know, a lot of countries, they do have... Uh, so they have this regulation that if any uh, gas supplier cuts off supply, they will have to pay penalties for it. So they're saying it now that, look, this is going to happen. happen. No. So don't talk about penalties. Don't talk about penalties because it's, it's the reality of our time. It's not like we're doing it because it's our fault or because we want to do it. So that's why they're bringing it up that it doesn't look like we can escape this one. There might actually be shortage of uh, uh, gas supply. And we're talking about the UK. Now, let's, I mean, these are consumers we've all, we've been talking about all along, Germany, the UK, and so on. On the other hand, the producers are meeting tomorrow. OPEC, OPEC Plus yes. is going to meet tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, uh, they... And, uh, I mean, their own interests and their own... Uh, uh, benefits are yes. completely different. Yes, they are different. In fact, somebody was saying, because we've seen the, the uh, oil prices surge since they started saying that they're going to be a huge cut in output uh, by tomorrow. Over a million barrels they want to cut, you know, get the quota that they give to their members. And Absolutely. somebody like, uh, don't they care about inflation? Because what it means, obviously, is, is that, that the prices are going to prices go through are the going roof. to go up, and we know the consequences that that will have for different economies. But, I mean, as you mentioned, and OPEC Plus, they have their own. Theirs is to protect their members, you know, and ensure that their economy, their revenue is going up. But, I mean, on the other side, what some analysts are even saying is, as we speak, a lot of countries cannot even meet up with the quota that OPEC Plus has given to them. Asking Nigeria is very far away from it. Nigeria is supposed to do about 1.8. We can't even do up to a million. Right. So even if by tomorrow OPEC Plus cuts 
uh, the quota given to Nigeria to say 1.5. We're not even meeting with more million. So it may not have... It may not it, have that much of exactly, an impact but you in know, terms of the overall... Yeah, value. but you know, markets always react to news, price things in, even before it really happens right. and, and all of that. So the market has been reacting since yesterday. Uh, we've seen prices of oil surge because... Uh, of, of, the, of the, Ahead of this meeting. Ahead of the meeting, which is still tomorrow. tomorrow. Now, <laughs> I, I'm happy you mentioned markets because that's where I'm going next. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it also appears as if uh, most of the time we say, oh, the reactions were mixed. But it does appear that some of this news, what we've been discussing, hmm. has also had an impact Obviously. on the markets. Oh, because it's the same human beings. It's the same human beings that are investors in these markets. So what the war has done to markets, I mean, it's been, it's been bloody. It's, it's been in the red. So we saw a little bit of recovery yesterday uh, because I think what happens is investors, I don't know how they do it, but they try to make the market start the month Positive, positive right. yes so maybe they're buying the dip because we have we had deep reds ending the month right. so they now start buying you know because it's to create some and activity they, exactly and then... yeah but that has not really changed the color of the market because I, I have some numbers now uh, in Nas Nasdaq the Nasdaq right. it's down year to date down almost 21 percent yes its index is down a FTSE 100 is down more than 6%, 6.44. The Shanghai Shenzhen is down 16.91%, almost 17%. The Luxembourg is down more than 25%. Now, NGX is up, but... That's the outlier. That's the one that seems to pop the trend. <laughs> but we've been losing. I mean, we started the year with maybe about 20% up. Now we're just about 14% up. So we've been losing month on month Months up till for, now. For a bit. Yes, we've been losing, just chipping it off there. The index was about 50. We got to 51. Now we are 40. I think we're 49 now. The market was closed yesterday. Right. You know, even though we ended Friday uh, positive, okay. you know, but I mean, it's been chipping off the positives that we have. And and uh, we might look red, we might look green, but I mean, I think the real you know, color... On the bigger color... Yes, the bigger, because the bigger when we look at the volume of trade, the value, when we look at the price of shares individually, then it shows that we have not escaped it. We are still in a bear market, which is uh, 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 like a transcending color for global markets. So we are not... Over... So I have to take my sentence back. <laughs> we are not bucking the trend. Then, uh, in the... We are not the pictures so were not quite, yeah, the picture, the picture was not quite yes, telling I mean, I mean, we've lost down to 14%, percent, so indeed, we're, indeed. we're still worse. And you know, there's the windfall tax. Uh, in the EU. Yes. You know, yesterday we talked about the windfall tax yes. in India. There's windfall tax for energy providers. There's windfall tax for oil and gas companies in the EU. Obviously, it's to get more money from them to try to... To, to be able to... Uh, source for all these subsidies that I'll are going to be electric, paid for. I'll pay for right. the electric heater that people really want, want to. to buy. So it's it's a squeezed time for uh, a lot of countries. But uh, in my mind, I think Juliana should be able to talk to. I don't know why the UK is feeling it so much. When we talk about the issue of recession, we see it coming really close in the UK. We talk about energy prices and the consequences. We see it really close in the UK. UK. So we saw the tax cut proposal proposal yeah. and I mean obviously because of what it to do to the debt profile of the country they've had to do a U-turn and uh, we yeah. saw the pound uh, uh, recovering a bit slightly yes slightly. just just on the on just the information that yeah. they are not going to go they ahead with that plan <laughs> we'll, we'll have to wait and see and as you said you'll ask Juliana <laughs> yes, uh, about sure this uh, uh, right after this program on business morning so do watch out uh, for that thank you Annie. thank you for having me still to come on the program freed as of star soldiers reunited with families in Turkey please stay on with us for staying tuned. We are on uh, the final lap of the program and here we're taking a look at some of the sports uh, news out of this conflict. The Moscow Regional Court has set October the 25th 
as an appeal date for American women's basketball star Brittany Griner. An appeal hearing will be heard at the Kimki City Court in Moscow region. Ms. Griner was sentenced to nine years of jail time in early August for deliberately smuggling drugs into Russia. She was arrested with less than one gram of cannabis oil in her luggage at Moscow's Chermevil International Airport on February the 17th. International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach has hinted that Russian athletes who do not support the country's invasion of Ukraine may be allowed back into international competition. In the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the IOC issued guidance to sports governing bodies in February to remove Russian and Belarusian athletes uh, from competition, but Bach has now outlined a different approach. His comments have sparked an angry reaction from Russian politicians and sports officials. Heavyweight boxing champion Alexander Yusik has returned to Ukraine's front lines where he is cheering up soldiers. Yusik's decision to return to boxing and take on Anthony Joshua again was inspired by his visit to a hospital where Ukrainian soldiers were being treated. Clemens claims that the boxer met wounded soldiers, some of whom were without legs, and was met with chairs as he entered the ward. The 35-year-old rematch with Anthony Joshua had earlier been postponed in light of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February, after which Yusik returned to his homeland to aid the war effort. In the rematch, the 35-year-old successfully defended his WBA, WBO, and IBF belts against Joshua. And finally on the program, videos and photos released last night show commanders of Mariupol's Azovstal are being reunited with their families in Turkey after being released from Russian captivity. The head of Ukraine's presidential office, Andrei Yemak, met with five Ukrainian servicemen, according to a release on the presidential website. The freed soldiers include Lieutenant Colonel Denis Propopenko, commander of the Azov Battalion that did much of the fighting, and his deputy, Sevetslav Palma, also freed was Sergei Volovsky, the commander of the 36th Marine Brigade, senior officer Oleg Komenko, and commander Dennis Schleger. The soldiers were seen hugging their children and their wives during the meeting. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky spoke with the freed soldiers during a phone call, saying, quote, We are all proud of you, and I'm very happy that you're with your relatives, that we have you, and most importantly, that you're not just heroes, but living heroes. On September the 21st, Russia and Ukraine carried out an unexpected prisoner swap, the largest since the war began, involving almost 300 people, including 10 foreigners and the commanders who led a prolonged Ukrainian defense of Mariupol earlier this year. And that's our program this morning. Thanks for being with us. My name is Ladia Kiri Dolwale. There's an update within the world today from 5 o'clock. Do watch out for that. The show is back tomorrow. Have a pleasant day ahead. Good morning.